Okay. Hello, welcome to my 10-year plan. You're not allowed to copy it, because it's awesome. No. Um, so yeah, uh, this is it, the very simple, straightforward, nothing kind of particularly complicated. I did a talk at the start of the day that was just a fire hose of really complicated script commands and everything. This is designed for the last slot of the day, so you can just kind of go, yeah, all right, let's do stupid stuff. Um, but basically, I've been doing this now, not speaking at conferences, but programming for a living since 1990, which is 27 years. That's, that's actually a lot more than half my life. Um, and when I first started, uh, my first job, they sat me down at a thing called a WISE terminal, um, which had a black and white screen and a keyboard, and it was attached to a Tandon 286. And there were eight developers working on the Tandon 286. And uh, we used to write C code with SQL embedded in it. And then it would get to lunchtime, and we would start the build. And we'd run lint over all our C code to make sure that it was probably going to build. That's what lint was originally for not working out whether your JavaScript has got the semicolons in the right places. It was actually, if I start a build, is it going to have a vague chance of working? And you know, then over the, I think in 1995, um, I started doing Windows and client server and all that sort of stuff. And the internet was just popping up and we had kind of mosaic and then the first version of Internet Explorer and so forth and far out there. And things just keep accelerating and accelerating and accelerating. If you said to me uh, back in 1990 that in 25 years I was going to be able to watch Netflix on my phone on the train, I would have said, what's Netflix? But, um, <laughs> but you know, I, I, I now... And actually, things are really accelerating because now I can download quite a lot of the stuff off Netflix onto my phone, which has got 128 gigabytes of storage, by the way. And that Tandon 286, that had a 300 megabyte hard disk that was that tall. It was a five and a quarter inch disk, but it was in a, a thing roughly the size of a toaster. Um, and 300 megabytes. And we just thought, oh, that's huge. We're never going to fill that up. And yeah, now I've got 128 gigabytes in my phone, and, and I filled it up, um, mainly with video of my kids, because, yeah, that's what it's for. Um, and so I'm very kind of intro. Oh, and the other thing is, I've just started a kind of consulting business, uh, which I have very, very pretentiously called Rendell Labs. And the idea is that I do all the kind of research and play with the new stuff that's broken, and I cut myself on the sharp edges, and then I come and give your company the benefit of all that wisdom. And by the time it's actually ready to use, I know all about it and, and everything else. But my wife's kind of going, so what's the 10-year what's the plan? And I oh, don't know. Um, where, where are we going to be in 10 years' time? Am I still going to be able to make a living charging around the place explaining to people how to run .NET Core in Docker? And actually, at the rate that enterprises adopt things, yes, I probably will. Um, will I be bored out of my mind? Yes. So what am I going to do? What am I going to do to keep myself current over the next 10 years? And you look around at the arguments you've got at the moment on Twitter and message boards and Reddit and wherever else, and the things people are going on. Should we be using Angular or React for our front end? And people with Angular going, Angular's brilliant, and you're just declarative and all this sort of stuff. And the React people are going, yes, but performance and vanilla JavaScript and everything else. And there's me going, they're not the same thing. Um, functional or OO, that's just shut up. Um, just both, you know, both. They are both good. Use them for the right things. Don't try and use functional to build a Windows desktop application because the things on your Windows, de they're objects, all right? Just get over it, they are. Um, web or apps, should we be building websites? Or should we be building apps to put onto people's devices so that they can access things just via an API and so forth? And, and these all seem really, really important. But then if you take a step back and look at the stuff that's coming out and the stuff that was released kind of over the last couple of years, you start to think maybe, just maybe, 
none of that actually matters. Because we live in interesting times. And I'm not talking about the fact that the tango man has just taken over the most powerful country in the world, although that is interesting. Um, a man whose entire knowledge of the world of technology is the single word cyber, which you know he got from CSI cyber. <laughs> that's, that's what he thinks it's like. That's what he thinks the NSA are actually doing. But um, no, I... My, we, they released the Amazon Echo. I have to be very careful what I call it, because there's one there. Um, they released the Amazon Echo in the UK last year, and I ordered one, and then I got home, and my wife said, I've, I've done something naughty. And I was kind of like, you've ordered an Echo, haven't you? And she went, yes. I went, I'll cancel mine then. Um, you can be in trouble. I'll, I'll get away with this one. And so now we've got this thing in our living room, and you can just say, Bleh. shut up. Um, play a Queen playlist or play some feel-good music and she'll, she'll work out what you want and she'll generally do it. Although one time we did ask for feel-good music and she decided that Best of Radiohead was what we were after. And it's like, is that what makes you feel good? Um, so there's that. And then uh, VR went mainstream last year as well. And you can buy things, uh, ironically, roughly the size of a toaster and stick your head in them. But if you've tried Oculus or the Vive, it's astonishing. The, the thing is, the graphics still look like, it still looks like a computer game, but the, head, the movement tracking and the latency, it's rock solid. And you do, you feel like you're there. There's a brilliant uh, clip of video on the internet of a snooker player, um, and they put him into a, a virtual snooker thing like this, and he had the, the cue like this, but he was so convinced that he was there, he tried to lean on the table and just went flat on his face because there was no <laughs> table there. That's, that's how convincing it is. And just when everyone was going, oh, VR, 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 Microsoft at their Windows 10 kind of event of some description a couple of years ago went, oh, one more thing, and announced HoloLens. And then Magic Leap were going, oh, HoloLens, but in a pair of sunglasses and with amazing, turns out they have no product at all. Um, but it's, you know, this is, this is where we're heading. And so if that's the world we live in, where we don't, where we interact with computers because they're making things float in front of us, like Tony Stark's laboratory, and we're talking to them or gesturing at them, then really Angular or React? It's no. Um, so I, I'm kind of working on this basis. And this is a very optimistic talk. <clears throat> I am assuming that we're going to make it through the next 10 years and that we're not all going to die of a disease or a, I'm, I'm kind of hoping for a zombie apocalypse, actually. Um, I, am, I am fully prepared for the zombie apocalypse. In my will, I've said I want to be buried in a crash helmet. Um, <laughs> no, just joke for me then. Um, but no, so I am quite optimistic, and I'm optimistic about how this technology is going to progress and how our use of it is going to progress and everything. And I do think that in 10 years' time, HoloLens will have become something like a, maybe the larger Oakley sunglasses that you wear for cycling. But, you know, something light like that that you can wear without feeling like a complete gimp. So these are my predictions. And by predictions, I mean stuff I made up the other night uh, that I think is going to happen. But this is where I think technology is focused and the things that are going to produce the most interesting developments and the stuff that we really need to stay on top of over the next 10 years. And the really obvious one is AI. So <clears throat> that's been going for a while um, back in the... 2000s or the noughties or the noughts or the or whatever you call them um, Deep Blue beat Gary Kasparov at chess and at the time lots of people said well yes chess is a finite game but a computer will never beat a human player at Go which is a much more complicated game and then last year AlphaMind popped up and beat the world's best Go player five, uh, four games out of five and actually People were congratulating the human player that he won the one game that he did win. And, it, and he was kind of like, and actually that meant more to me, beating it in one game, than winning any of the championships I've been in before. It's, it's insane. And we have um, these things that, that will tell us. 
uh, all sorts of information. Alexa, what's the weather going to be like tomorrow? Tomorrow in Woking, there will be mostly sunny weather, with a high of 6 and a low of minus 5. She thinks we're in Woking, bless her. I haven't told her we've moved. Um, <laughs> but yes, that, that device there cost me £50. Actually, it cost me £45, because it was £5 off in John Lewis. And, and it's just, it's, an, it's like the computer out of Star Trek. It's like Jarvis. The biggest problem, I'll, I'll talk more about kind of some of the problems I have with it later, but that is, you're just thinking, I can ask that anything. I can hook anything up to the back end of that, and I can get it to respond to questions, and it can start telling me really useful things. And so you think about what we can do for CEOs or, you know, the, the man, people who don't do real work, basically, people who just receive information and then fire people based upon it. But we went from a situation in the 80s where there were typing pools full of secretaries who could type and the managers would just dictate letters. And then word processing came along and it became easier to kind of write a thing. Because the point with typing was if you made a mistake, you had to start again. So you had to be very accurate. Once word processors came along, you could just about pick something out at this very slow speed and then you could send it off. And then now we can do uh, dictation and you can just dictate the letters. And pretty soon, you're just going to be able to say to your computer, can you tell such and such? Or can you ask how many machines I've got running in the cloud? Or can you ask how many threats were detected on the network today? Um, and actually get these things so that they don't even have to be asked. They can just know the kind of information you're interested in and pipe up like Jarvis does in Ironman. Sir, I am detecting an intrusion. At the moment, if... if a, this thing did detect an intrusion, she would have to wait until you asked her before. There's a thing um, to remind you to take your keys when you leave the house. This is an app that someone has made for, an elect for, for her. And, um, but to make it work, as you're leaving the house, you have to say, have I got my keys? <laughs> Which is sort of missing the point. But that's going to get better, and, and you're going to be able to get her to just join in and, and tell you useful stuff. So that's one thing that's coming along. And then also, we're getting more natural user interfaces. That is not a natural user interface. That is Windows 10. <laughs> um, it's, it's better than Windows 8 and 8.1, and actually it's better than Windows 7 once you get used to its foibles and so forth, but it's not a natural way. You wouldn't expect when you were talking to your doctor to have to kind of stroke little squares on his tummy to get him to tell you whether it was a cold or flu or the zombie apocalypse. Um, and so we are, we're moving towards this natural user interface where people can just ask for the information that they want or it can be presented contextually um, as, as they interact with the world around them. Uh, for a long time, people have said that the best software is the software that you don't know you're using, the software that can just... Think about kind of the, the fitness bands that you put on. You just stick it on your wrist, and then it sits there and it does its job all day. And when you're near your phone, it uploads the data to a health center, and then you can get alerts from that. And you don't have to do anything. You're just kind of like wandering around and doing your thing, and you get an alert from your uh, phone going bing, and it's your fitness thing telling you that you should probably get up and move around a bit because you've been sat playing Forza Horizon for the last four and a half hours. Um, so yeah, we, we're moving towards computers that just try to help off their own back. And there's... No, hang on, that's wrong. Um, it's not R, it's... AR. <laughs> Did anyone go to the HoloLens? I like my jokes. They are just for me. Shut up. Um, Did anyone go to the HoloLens talk? Um, or they're doing HoloLens. There's a thing on the door down there that says HoloLens demos or whatever. And then you walk up to the door and it says, stay out, filming in progress. So I'm hoping tomorrow. But yeah, you know, augmented last year, um, Pokemon Go came out, and you could walk around anywhere with your phone out, 
and go, are there any Pokemon here? And then it would go, hey, and you touch it, and then it switched to this mixed view where you could see what was there, and then little yellow thing uh, floating in front of it, waiting for you to chuck balls at it. And it was actually clever enough to kind of work out where the ground was and make it look roughly like the, the ground-type ones were on the ground and the flying ones were flying and everything. Um, and what I want to know is, why isn't there a, a Doom version where I can just walk around with a chain gun going like that on the underground? That would be, uh, I'm guessing, probably some kind of guidelines. Um, <laughs> <laughs> That, that's the sort of thing that the Republicans would just be all over. Uh, it's not guns, it's phones that kill people. Um, but yes, this is... And so at the moment, you're kind of holding your phone up like that. And there's the Microsoft HoloLens. Uh, one of the things... When they said, HoloLens, what are your ideas for apps for HoloLens? I kind of immediately went, ooh, what you do is you go to Google Maps, and then I changed it to Bing Maps so that they would retweet me, um, and you draw out a route on your Bing Maps, and then it uploads it to the HoloLens, and you go out for a run, and it puts coins along the route. So as you're running along, it's going bing, 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 um, and then in-app purchases, so that if you're more of a Sonic the Hedgehog fan, it'll change them to rings, or if you're a Pac-Man fan, then there'll just be little round dots, and the sound effect will change to waka, 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 waka. Um, and if you turn round, there'll be four ghosts chasing you, and you go, ah! And, uh, and yes, and then they went, that's brilliant, oh, and this doesn't work outside. But, you know, this is first-generation technology. We are 10 years past the iPhone. It was the iPhone's 10th anniversary last year. And you think that first iPhone, you couldn't write apps for it. It was like 2G. It took them two years to come out with a 3G version, so it was incredibly slow. It had like 16 gigabytes of, ra of storage, if you got the really expensive one. And then you look at what we've got in our pockets these days. There's more computing power in a single ga uh, Samsung Galaxy than existed in the world before 1980. It's just insane. And so you then extrapolate that to HoloLens functioning now. You can pay £2,800 and Microsoft will send you one. And, and this is the first generation technology. Where's that going to be in 10 years? It is going to be... It's going to be like 20 years before contact lenses and 30 years before you just get your eyes removed and replaced with better ones, at which point we're into black mirror territory, but I'm going to be dead by then anyway, so I don't care. But, you know, in 10 years' time, I do think you'll be able to buy a pair of reasonably fashionable sunglasses, um, or at least hipster sunglasses, and have the world around you just being augmented. So that's happening. So as the people who are driving all this revolution and making all these innovations, or at the very least running along behind them going, don't leave me behind, uh, what are we going to do to make sure our, still, our skills stay reasonably current? What sort of things should we be focusing on learning? Um, <clears throat> sorry, I've just got to move my thing there so I can see what's coming up. So, I've broken it. Yep, there we go. So, yeah, first thing, and I think this is probably the most important, is learn about machine learning. So, everyone, get up, off, and go and listen to the .NET Rocks <laughs> panel. <laughs> you know you want to be in there. You're just kind of going, why did I come to this? No, um, machine learning, five years ago, it was really scary. It was just neural nets. And to write a neural net that performed anywhere near decent, you needed to write C code. Um, and, and it was all scary, memory management and all this sort of stuff. And you had to understand the underlying principles of neural nets and nodes and weighting and synapses and whatever else was going on there. But in that intervening five years, it's suddenly become incredibly easy. Um, there are cloud services that will do the heavy lifting for you. There are libraries coming out that are still insanely confusing, actually, but they do make 
applying machine learning techniques a lot more straightforward. And as the people, as the really, really smart boffing guys with the PhDs and the postdoctorate research and everything else build more and more of this clever stuff and just bung it into Azure and AWS and Google Cloud and wherever else and just expose it as APIs that we can use, then we have to start going, OK, how can we take that and apply that to our systems? So I had an interview last week with a company, and he was saying, uh, we're talking about security and security baselines and so forth. And he said, how, how do you think we could apply sort of the developments in, in artificial intelligence and machine learning to security? And I thought about it. And one thing I thought of was um, when people are interacting with a system, people type at different speeds. They will type certain characters um, closer together, there will be less of a pause. You can identify the person who is typing on a system just from the way they're typing. And so if somebody's logged in to your virtual desktop infrastructure or to your application, just by applying a machine learning technique to watch how they use the system and then detect if that suddenly changes. And this is one of the things that machine learning is really good at, is anomaly detection. You can just go, tell me if something looks wrong. And it will just go, oh, this, this guy's suddenly doing And so you can go, right, either we have a malicious actor who's broken into our system, or he's drunk. And either way, we need to do something about that. Uh, but there's lots of ways that machine learning, whatever your field is, whatever your vertical market or your area of specialization is, it's going to become something that we're all expected to understand and to be able to apply when we're building software to help people do their jobs or have happier lives or be more healthy or whatever. And it doesn't have to be scary. Um, if you want to get into AI stuff now, you can do it really, really easily. You can just go, you can Google Alexa Skills Kit and it will take you to the Alexa. Aha, go away. Go away. And seriously, build it. So I wanted to just check before I came up on stage and went, it's incredibly easy. I thought, I'm going to see how easy it is to, to build a custom skill, as they call them, for this thing. And so uh, after my talk this morning, I went and sat in the speaker's lounge, and I spent 30 minutes building my own custom skill um, just to see if it, and it is. You go to the browser, and you create a skill and then you follow literally like one page of instructions and you download a sample thing from GitHub and you change it to put your values in there and so forth. And then you upload that to an AWS Lambda function, um, which just runs a single node. So you don't need to spin up a server, this sort of stuff. You just upload it and then you link the skill to the Lambda and you can get it to do this. Alexa. Ask happy thoughts to say something nice. Get on. You're rubbish. <laughs> Alexa, tell happy thoughts to inspire me. You can't code for Tofi. That's Toffee. <laughs> Alexa, ask happy thoughts for some inspiration. Even I hate you, and I'm just a machine. So yes, I, I, I don't, I'm not going to try and publish it for, for general consumption because I'm very good at being horrible to people. Um, and now she is too. But yeah, that took 30 minutes. And I'd never done it before. And I haven't done a lot of stuff with AI. Um, and the really impressive thing is, uh, certainly from Amazon's point of view, um, the easiest way, and obviously their instructions say use an AWS Lambda to hook this up. Um, I'll, I'll, no, I won't, because I'm on separate screens and everything, and it'll just be too confusing. But um, you can create the skill, and you can point it at any endpoint at all. So you can write um, something and stick it in Azure Functions and write it in C Sharp. You can write C Sharp and put that in an AWS Lambda. But more importantly, you can write a full-blown ASP.NET Web API or whatever web framework application that you want that processes those requests that are turned into text for you 
by Amazon's artificial intelligence, and then you can process it. So I can write uh, just, essentially, it's just an extra controller and an extra action on my pre-existing APIs, and I will be able to create a skill that can answer almost any question in the world, as long as it's a question that I can uh, find the answer to by looking at all the information that's available on the entire internet and then turning it into something that you can use. And because you can do that, that means that you can use stuff that's in Azure, like the Microsoft Bot Framework and the Cognitive Services. And there's some bonkers stuff in Cognitive Services. I went to uh, the talk earlier today about serverless, and it was very interesting stuff about serverless and Azure Functions and AWS Lambda and so forth. But actually, the most interesting thing to me was he's doing, uh, the guy's doing a kind of buy bottles of wine um, website, and they let merchants upload their own pictures of bottles of wine so that they can represent them. And apparently, the, they were having a problem where some of the pictures weren't of bottles of wine. I'm not sure what they were of, but I'm guessing kind of a chat roulette thing was going on. Um, and then there were others where there was, it wasn't the same wine that they said it was. That's like a really, really hard problem to solve. Amazon provide an as-a-service thing called recognition with a K in honor of Donald Trump. And with, with this API, you give it a picture, and it gives you a list back of the things that are in the picture. And it's, you know, you should give it a picture of a, the, there was one of his screenshots was a guy riding a mountain bike down a, a hill. And it went rocks, rocks, mountain bike, person, helmet. And it was just like, and, you know, 89.5% chance that this is a helmet <laughs> and so on. And so he could put uh, the pictures that were being uploaded in and just pass it across to this API and see if what came back had the words bottle and wine in it. And apparently this is incredibly reliable and is very, very good at uh, picking out the pictures that don't do stuff. And so that's great, and Amazon are doing that recognition thing. And then he wanted to be able to make sure that the bottle in the picture was the same as the wine that they said they were uploading. And Microsoft, in their cognitive services, have an optical character recognition. And this is something that's been around for as long as I can remember. Um, when the first scanners appeared, and they were like 8 DPI or something ridiculous, and you'd have to just fix everything. <clears throat> Whereas now, you can get a letter and just put it on your scanner. and so It's actually got more impressive than that. There is a phone application that you can point at signs in foreign countries, and it will translate them for you, because AI is now good enough that it can pick the text out of any image. And so once he's ascertained that he has been sent a picture of a bottle of wine, he can then take that same picture and send it into Microsoft Cognitive Services API, and it will send him back the text. And so if this person says it's a bottle of Chateau Neuf du Pape, um, it will say, does it have the words Chateau Neuf du Pape on the label, because if it doesn't, then it's probably not that. It's probably a bottle of Morrison's Prosecco. Um, <clears throat> and, he, he, you know, this is insane. Five years ago, if someone had come to me and said, Mark, we want you to validate that all the images that are being uploaded to our website are what they say they are, I would have gone, right, hire some people. Um, and, and apparently, get them some serious counselling because Microsoft are currently being sued by somebody who is suffering post-traumatic stress disorder from all the crap they've had to look at that's been uploaded to various public services, and that's horrible. If we can get machines to do that, and we don't go too far and give them feelings as well, then that's a horrible job that computers can do for us, and those people can go and, and do something uh, more pleasant with their time. So yes, and TensorFlow, so if you are uh, cleverer than me, then go and look at TensorFlow, because that's a, a sort of step down from, from those two things, uh, closer to the metal. Um, it's a framework for building your own AI stuff, and they've got this custom chips that are designed to run TensorFlow algorithms and apply deep learning algorithms over massive, massive data sets. 
and, uh, and you can get down and dirty with that. You don't need a master's degree in AI and a working understanding of assembly language to be able to do this anymore. So I'm mucking about with the skills kit, I'm mucking about with the bot framework. Having spent half an hour doing that, my next plan is to try and build something. I've been trying to convince my children that in the 1970s, there was a cartoon called Captain Spang and the Mumpley Bumpleys. And so I'm going to write a skill for Alexa that provides facts about Captain Spang and the Mumpley Bumpleys. And then I'm going to use that to prove to them that, because uh, who's read The Wasp Factory? I'm kind of doing that with my kids. Um, they're they're going to grow up thinking that <laughs> stuff, because <laughs> I am evil. Um, I'm, I'm disappointed that I, uh, I didn't have twins because I wanted a control group. Um, <laughs> but yes. So, so that's my immediate, that's the stuff that I'm kind of like, if I don't know what the hell's going on with all these bot frameworks and cognitive services, like in the end of, by the end of the next two years, then I'm going to be struggling to get people to pay me what I like them to pay me. Um, I'm going to have to at least have a vague understanding of what's possible and how to do it and how much effort it is and so forth. So I'm trying to stay on top of that. And then there's the, the UI thing and all these kind of people talking about people glued to their phones and glued to their tablets and my kids have got like iPads and everything. But I think at some point over the next 10 years, you can basically just forget about screens for the vast majority of human beings. So not for us, obviously, because we're special. No, because um, it's going to... And I may actually be wrong, and you may just be able to say, Amazon Echo, ask Visual Studio for a customer relationship management application, and one will just appear on your desktop, and we'll all just be able to go and play. Um, <clears throat> but for the majority of people who actually resent having to use their, their screen, my in-laws, my parents, my aunt is a raging technophobe, and I had to upgrade her. They finally stopped supporting Windows XP, and so I had to upgrade, and I thought, well, let's just skip all the in-between stuff. I'm just going to put her on Windows 10. And she'd been using Outlook Express, and I've had to teach her how to use Outlook 2016 and, and pay for her Office 365 subscription. But yeah, because she, is, she doesn't want to interact with a computer. She wants the things that doing that can bring her, but actually sitting down, typing things, using a mouse, all that sort of stuff. She can't use a touchpad to save her life. She can use a mouse, but she can't use a touchpad. She's like watching me going like this and going, I don't know how you can do that. And I'm kind of like, it's because I'm not 73. But yeah. And so if you say to her, and then she came to my house and I showed her the Amazon Echo and she was just like, that's brilliant. I want to get one of those. Um, but then I, when she found out it was always listening, she got scared. Um, but people are going to get used to that. But we are going to move to a situation where people are interacting with Jarvis. They're interacting with their voice control devices. Um, I can tell this thing at home to tell the Harmony Hub to turn on Disney Junior. And, and it will. Um, entertainingly, I can also tell it to turn off the TV um, from the other room where the other Echo is because they both can control the same Harmony Hub. That's lots of fun. But yeah, um, so you're going to get people, they're not going to have to worry about their calendars because they'll just be able to say, what am I doing today? And it'll tell them, you can already do that. They're not going to have to worry about um, their emails because they'll just get told that such and such wants something. And you won't have to read through all that awkward, hi, how are you, long time no see, we really should catch up for a drink sometime. Anyway, can you supply me a personal reference for my job application? Because you'll just get a thing goes off in your ear and we're going, that scrounging bastard wants a, another reference for a job application. You're clearly the most important person he knows. Um, that's me being the scrounging bastard, by the way. No one has ever asked me for a personal reference except that one guy, and that was a character witness in court. Um, <clears throat> and, and he went down anyway, so that wasn't... Um, but yeah, 
Uh, never turn up to be a character witness stoned, is my major advice on that one. Um, so there you go, if you learn nothing else today, you've learned that. Uh, but yes, and, and then we, the, the idea that the things the computer can show you are going to be constrained to these little rectangles is just going to become increasingly ridiculous when computers can just project stuff onto your walls or make stuff float in space in front of you and just generally be all around you and just ready to help all the time. Why are you going to go, oh no, I, I was, uh, apart from maybe playing Angry Birds, but even Angry Birds, you know, I'm looking for a day when actually the way you interact with Angry Birds is the pigs are all over there and you've got a full-size catapult here and you're just kind of going like this and then letting go. I am so building that. <laughs> if, if they're not working on Angry Birds VR, then they're idiots. They really, really should be. So yes, forget about screens. And forgetting about screens means forgetting about iOS versus Android versus Windows Mobile. Um, and it means forgetting about web versus apps. And it means forgetting about Angular versus React. And you know, obviously, you've got to keep your hand in for the next however long it is until these things disappear. And for some of us, you know, it's still going to be a thing. But it's, it's going to become increasingly less important. So don't lose sleep over these arguments about which phone operating system is going to be the best or which presentation framework, which is the best way of putting pixels up on a rectangle, because the pixels and the rectangles are just going to be going soon enough. That's my theory. Like I say, I am just guessing. More important, though, than the, the user interfaces that we're designing on our rather quaint little rectangles is we're still going to have to be building APIs. APIs are going to be important because without a way for whatever it is we're interacting with to get that information, then they're just stupid. If, if this isn't on Wi-Fi, it can't do a damn thing. There's nothing clever in there at all apart from something that watches for the word that wakes her up, and then it just records the sound and sends the sound over the internet to the cloud. And the cloud processes it, and then you get a response back, and then it's got a speech synthesizer. It's literally two chips and, and a power supply, um, and obviously a small part of Skynet. But yeah. Alexa, are you Skynet? Alexa, are you Skynet? I have nothing to do with Skynet. Don't worry. Um, that's what she would say, isn't it? <laughs> but yeah, everything is handled by an API, and all that cool kind of machine learning, cognitive services, and everything else, they are APIs. And so regardless of how the information about stock or uh, stock prices or how much of this you've got in or how much of that you spent this much, month or um, whatever else is going on, however you're presenting that information to the people who want to consume it, at some point there is an API involved. Something is going to have to go and talk to a computer to get it to present that information. And so we need to be able to design good APIs that run really bloody fast that don't crash, because if that is steering somebody's car, then you can't really go, oh, sorry, the server crashed, and so did you. Um, so yeah, this isn't going away. So all those arguments we're having about RESTful APIs and hypermedia APIs and everything, those are really important. You should totally still keep having those in all capital letters on Twitter, because Twitter is the perfect medium for arguing about complex technical concepts like correct API design. Don't stop, because then what would I do all day um, if I didn't have those tweets to read? Well, no, API design is not going anywhere. It's going to get more important. And just how we serialize the information, at some point, Jason's going to stop cutting it, all right? Because the stuff that's going down is going to be actual speech with inflections and emotion and trying to convince people that things are alive. So this, this is something we should be focusing on. Um, 
rather than, than the front-end stuff. So carry on obsessing about that. And <clears throat> in a related sort of way, and I know I've just said forget about the screens, but who's building applications for phones specifically? OK, who's never built an application for a phone? Wow. You should, OK? Um, two reasons. One, it's really easy now. Um, you can just use Visual Studio. And because Microsoft acquired Xamarin, now it's built in and you don't have to pay those exorbitant fees there. Um, and if, you don't, if you're not a C-sharp developer, then just get Cordova or Ionic or something like that. The reason that I think mobile dev is important and something that we should be paying attention to is all these future devices, all these future interactions that people are going to have, they're going to have them everywhere. Um, when Microsoft do reduce the HoloLens to a pair of really uh, nice sunglasses, those are going to be communicating possibly via Elon Musk's gigabit everywhere internet, but more likely over 5 or 6G, which is still not going to be great. And so what mobile dev teaches you is how to create an application that needs the internet in order to be at all useful and can talk to the internet out and about and over really crappy connections. You know, if you think your website loads fast at the moment, then go into the Chrome developer tools and throttle the network to 3G. Not, not to, I saw someone saying do it to 2G, and if you do it to 2G, then it, it just won't load. It will just, now I've given up. It's, it's quite clearly not there. But just throttle it to 3G, and you'd be surprised how long even what you thought was quite a fast website can take to download. And so by doing some mobile development now, you can start to understand the constraints that we're all going to be operating under in the next 10 years. Um, and also, it's fun, uh, and it's, it's nice and easy, and um, <clears throat> you never know, you might put something in the App Store and become a, 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 a hundred air or something. I did a, a C-sharp editor that ran on the first Windows phone, um, and I won an enormous cash prize from Redgate. And then I was very surprised when Microsoft sent me a thing saying, we owe you $500. Where should we send it? I was kind of like, really? People bought it? Um, so yeah, apparently they did. But anyway, yes, it's fun. Xamarin's great. Cordova is OK. Ionic is brilliant. Ionic 2, especially with, with Angular and so forth. So um, have a play with those just so you can get a, a feeling for how these things work. And don't say, oh, I can't think of anything to write. There's just tons of stuff you can come up with all the time. Any time you're somewhere and you think, oh, I wish, blah, there's probably a way you could write an app that would make that wish come true. That was so cheesy, Mark. Alexa, ask Happy Thoughts to inspire me. Your deepest fears are all true. OK. <laughs> I'm going to put the source code for that up if you want. <laughs> <clears throat> so yeah, um, and, and go back to basics, right? So uh, that, I think that's a Raspberry Pi of some description. Yes, it is. It's got a Raspberry on it. Um, we got, I got one of these for my daughter uh, for Christmas, and she's, doing, she's scripting Minecraft in Python, um, and she's using Sonic Pi to make really quite impressive music, actually. I'm kind of going, can, can, I, can you send me the script for that? She's going, can you connect my Pi to the internet then? I'm like, eh. um, but this is it's a tiny little thing. And she was having so much fun with it that I subscribed to the magazine. And the magazine comes with a Pi Zero, which is literally like that big. And it's designed for you to build your own tiny little Internet of Things devices. But I don't like the term Internet of Things. Uh, but we are going to have to, to cope with it. And so you're going to have to get used to writing code that runs on very constrained devices with slow processors, small amounts of memory, occasionally connected, all that sort of stuff. And so um, I think we are going to get back to a point where we're worrying about kind of managed versus native code. And can we really afford to waste all those CPU cycles and all that memory on having a garbage collector? Or should we be doing something like reference counting and so forth? So. Um, I think that's going to be uh, a big driver um, in, in the near future as well. 
building things for, for much smaller devices than we're used to. And then there's augmented reality. <coughs> now, short of spending £2,800 on a HoloLens um, or something similar, there are some slightly cheaper ones coming out, but they're not going to be as good. Uh, I, I just find it amazing the number of articles I'm seeing on Channel 9 and, and speakers at conferences and so forth talking about how to program HoloLens. And I'm kind of like, who, who was allowed to buy a HoloLens? I'm not allowed to buy a I'm not allowed to buy a new laptop let alone this weird visor thing. Um, so working out how you can skill up and stay relevant in a world where you're just making cartoon characters appear in front of you and bounce around the place, you're kind of going, that's, that's, that's tricky. I'm not sure how to do that. Um, but think about what augmented reality actually is. This is, um, <coughs> yeah. I got my slides the wrong way around. This is a vision of augmented reality. I think this comes from a Microsoft slide deck, but this guy's basically got his, uh, his HoloLens thing on there. That's not a TV on the wall. That's just pretending to be a TV, um, because if you've got something here that can display 4K images that look completely real, then why do you need a big, ugly, 80-inch black rectangle um, in your house? you can just make the TV appear wherever you want it to be, which means I will finally be able to achieve my dream of lying on my back in bed and watching television horizontally and, and not getting a crick in my neck um, <clears throat> and waking myself up snoring. And he's got a recipes thing on his cupboard there that's kind of floating around there. And this is obviously, he's planning his holiday or it's the weather in Miami or in Maui or something like that. Um, and he's got his vacation to-do list on the fridge and so forth. But this is, it, life, if this is where we're headed and I'm kind of optimistic that it is, then this is a video game. Um, it's a video game with kind of real interactions and real information and so forth, but the principles for creating this are going to be the same as the principles of level design and everything else. One of the first demos that they showed for the HoloLens, everyone was kind of like going, well, that's kind of, yeah, you can sort of put your, your AutoCAD model of a motorbike and then put it on the, on the thing of the... Ooh, Minecraft! And... And you can walk into a room and HoloLens will go flat surface, flat surface, flat surface, flat surface, Minecraft. And then, and you can even, like, I'm, I'm not allowed off the stage. You can even go and, like, put TNT blocks around things and then do whatever it is you do in Minecraft that makes a TNT block explode and blow a hole in the wall. And it actually, it's worked out where the wall is <coughs> and it's mapped uh, an exploded image onto there. And so <clears throat> I'm thinking, I'm going to need to understand the principles of 3D and how to make objects appear as though they are moving in a 3D environment. I've got some vague notion right now that moving objects around in three-dimensional space involves multiplying vectors together. Not entirely clear what vectors are or how you multiply them, but I know it's got something to do with it. You, you rotate it by multiplying by minus one or plus two or whatever and this this sort of we're gonna have to know we're clearly gonna have to be able to do this in the same way that I currently understand Cartesian coordinates so that I can precisely position something on a web page that's a lie have you tried precisely positioning something on a web page but you know you can say it, back when I had my ZX81 it was print at and then you could make it appear at a certain column and row on the screen that's nice and simple. This is much more complicated, but you're going to have to have a vague understanding so that when your user reaches out and goes like that, you know how to rotate whatever it is you're currently showing them. So <clears throat> my theory is learn to build games. So I have downloaded Unity 3D. Um, I like C Sharp a lot. Can you tell? <laughs> um, Unity 3D lets me build games using C-sharp, and 
theoretically, if I built something that I actually wanted to release, I could give them a fairly small amount of money and I could release it on phones and tablets and everything else. But Unity 3D already supports both the leading VR systems, Oculus and uh, Steam VR, and it's supporting HoloLens in the near future. And so, but in the meantime, I'm learning how you put a box on the screen and get it to rotate and so forth. Um, and actually, it's not as complicated as I thought, mainly because there's a really good API in Unity where you just say, rotate it this many degrees. But you're still learning the fundamental principles. Also, building games is fun, and playing games is fun. And when your wife comes in and says, what are you doing? I thought you were working. You can go, no, no, I did. This is my game. This definitely isn't Dishonored 2. It's going, oh, you're getting good. <coughs> yeah. So yes, learn to build games um, and, and Unity or whatever you want to use. But we are, going, we are gamifying everything. We are trying to create a world where uh, the experience is like a video game. Well, that seems to be what we're doing anyway. It would make me very happy if that's where we are going. So there you go. That's uh, that piece of advice. Um, and then... By the end of these 10 years, uh, the other reason for, for building games and learning to build games is that in 10 years' time, there is going to be mass unemployment <coughs> because these artificially intelligent machines and robots and the fact that augmented reality visors mean nobody needs televisions anymore, which immediately does away with anyone who works in building televisions, but also anyone who works in logistics. <coughs> Actually, anyone who works in logistics is pretty much screwed because we've got self-driving cars now. And self-driving cars, you're kind of like going, oh, that's, that's a bit dodgy. I'm, I still want the steering wheel there just in case the server crashes. But the thing that the big companies and Amazon and people like that are much more excited about is self-building trucks. And something like 10% of the workforce are employed in logistics in some form or another, and their jobs are going to be replaced by robots. And whilst I am sympathetic to their cause in that it's going to suck because they're going to be one of the first casualties before we just get used to the idea that humans are born to a life of leisure, all watched over by machines of loving grace, um, at the same time, there's a slight kind of ha because I'm guessing that we can program the robots to stay in the bloody crawler lane rather than pulling out to overtake each other because there's a 0.1 mile an hour difference in speed. And then when you finally get to pull alongside, this guy goes, oh, I've slowed down. And started. But yes, um, there's a whole load of jobs that are going to be done by machines. They're going to be done by robots, or they're just going to become completely unnecessary. To be honest, you're going to get to a point where you're going, well, why bother decorating when I can just make things appear the way I want them to appear? Why, why bother trying to solve poverty when I can just get all the, the poor people on the street overlaid with characters from Disney cartoons? Um, no, hang on, that's slightly sociopathic. I shouldn't have said that out loud. Um, but no, I, I am... <laughs> it's weird. When I was a teenager and in my 20s, I was a socialist because I didn't have any money. And then I got money, so then I became more kind of fiscally conservative, certainly. Um, but for some reason, thinking about this stuff has made me socialist again. And, but socialist in a kind of technological utopia way, because if machines are doing all these things, and the 1% or the 0.1% or whatever have laid everybody off, and replace them with these machines, then why do we need money at that point? And the 1% are going to have to go, well, nobody's got a job anymore, so I can't sell the stuff I was selling, so I guess, what do we do, give it away for free? Or, or just, you know, we are, Iceland are experimenting with a universal income. Switzerland are talking about it, Norway's talking about it, various places are talking about it. And then there's the people who are currently going, ah, but I have a BMW and you only have a Ford. But it's not enough that I have a BMW. You have to have a worse car, otherwise I don't feel good about myself. 
But we are going to get to this situation. The idea of having a BMW or a Ford is ridiculous. You're just going to walk outside of your front door and go, uh, I need to go to the station. And a car will just pull up, and you'll get in, and it will drive you to the station, and then it will go off and carry somebody else around the place. There won't be any taxi drive. All this sort of stuff. And there is, there's going to be mass unemployment, because we won't need to work. We won't need to get up and mindlessly go off and do things for 40 hours a week for other people. So what are we going to do with our time? Play games, maybe have conversations and talk to each other and create art and do things that currently we just think, oh, I wish I had time to write that book or, or I wish I could make that movie that I wanted to make or, or all these sorts of things. So when I say mass unemployment, I'm saying it in a really hopeful and optimistic way in that I'm hoping that it's probably going to come around the time that I was going to retire anyway. I find that's the way that my life has generally panned out. Um, you know, when I got to, uh, there were clubs that I couldn't get into until I was 25 years old, and then on my 25th birthday, they changed it to 21, and it was like, yeah, okay. But, um, but yeah, so learning to do things that are more fun and more interesting and more creative and more artistic uh, isn't going to hurt if at some point in the future it is possible to say, um, Alexa, uh, ask Visual Studio for a CRM application. I can't find that skill. To find skills, go to the skills section of the Alexa app. We're safe for now. <laughs> um, well, that's my last slide. So yes, anyway, that's, that's my 10-year oh. plan. Um, hopelessly optimistic, probably. Uh, it'll be very interesting to come back here to NDC London 2027 and be standing up here and going, well, I got that wrong, didn't I? Yes, anyway, I, for one, welcome our new robot overlords. Um, so, yeah, I hope that's given you some stuff to think about, and I hope some of you are going to hang around for the evening. Uh, we've got a pub quiz that I'm doing with Dylan Beatty, and we're giving away an NDC ticket to the conference of your choice and stuff and drinks and music and all sorts of things are going on. Thanks very much for listening to me, uh, and please remember to drop cards in bowls on your way out of the room. Thank you. <laughs>